Your blood is no longer just type A or type O, negative or positive. We now know that it's full of biomarkers and thus potential. Joining us now for more on how one group of researchers hopes a simple blood test could help guide our diagnosis and treatment of depression, here's Harriet Feilauder. She is Director of Molecular Diagnostics at Queen's University. And I always like to welcome people here off the top, but I really want to welcome you. Thank you. Because you got up at 4 a.m. to hit a train <laughs> to come to Toronto today all the way from Kingston, so we're really grateful you did that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with a quote from the medical journal called Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience. An excerpt of an article which says, numerous studies have demonstrated that symptoms of chronic neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's diseases, vascular and frontotemporal dementias, occur 10 to 20 years after the beginning of the pathology. Let's start by trying to understand this. The delay between the start of these, these diseases and when we first see their symptoms and why that delay has made treating them so challenging. Right. So it's definitely true that when people finally come for clinical attention, the disease has been progressing behind the scenes and causing cellular damage for, as you said, up to decades. Mm. Um, that kind of damage can be either an accumulation of abnormal proteins or it can be a lot of neuronal cell death through oxidative stress. What's and oxidative stress? Oxidative stress is a, a stress when the mitochondria can no longer perform properly in the cells. And so the cells give up and they die, basically. Uh. And this affects mostly the neurons. Um, because that's happening behind the scenes and because most of the treatments that we can offer people when they do get diagnosed don't reverse those kinds of damages, uh, that means that what we're usually doing is treating symptoms or trying to slow further progression. And so you can understand that if you've had a couple of decades of damage already and you can't really reverse that damage, then you're probably not treated as well as you might have been had you been found earlier. Well, in some respects, I guess it's probably too late at that point. Uh, so there are some treatments that are looking to reverse some of the damage, but I would say for the most part uh, that's not mainstream yet and is not something that's, that's uh, giving the kind of uh, results that we would like to see mm. for these people. Now on that list of things I mentioned was not depression, and yet depression somehow figures into this mix. How so? So depression figures into the mix. Uh, it's a different kind of disease, though. So unlike the ones that you just talked about, there isn't really an obvious cellular damage course in depression, although there are certainly some um, arguments that there is cellular damage and some neuronal cell death in depression as well. But what you don't see is that same kind of buildup of abnormal proteins or those kinds of hallmarks of the real neurodegenerative diseases. So in depression, the, the, the problem is actually a little bit different or quite a bit different. So in depression, it's not so much looking for an early diagnosis. It's more looking for once you've diagnosed somebody, what do you do? So there are a lot of treatments available for people who suffer from major depression, and they can range from drug treatments from things like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs, right. which are quite, quite common. You're going to be the queen um, of acronyms today by the I time am, we're done with I you, am. I can tell. Um, and uh, you can also treat with uh, neurostimulation or you can treat with cognitive behavioral therapies or talk therapy as it might be called. Um, being able to select which of those treatments is going to work best for the patient at the time is something that right now there's no marker to help us do that. Mm. So clinicians are really faced with a problem because depression is an extremely common disease. About one in six Canadians uh, will probably suffer from a depressive event that should or would warrant some clinical in, uh, intervention in their lifetime. And with those kinds of numbers, uh, you can imagine the lost quality of life, the lost time, uh, the side effects, and the cost of prescribing drugs that don't work. Hmm. Let's talk about your connection to this issue now. And again, consistent with your being the queen of the acronyms on this program, can bind. Can bind. Right. C A N B I N D. B I N D, right. What does all that stand for? So that stands for the Canadian Biomarker Integration Network for Depression. And it's a fancy way of saying this is a, this is a program uh, that's a national program. It's funded in part by the Ontario Brain Institute, but also by other institutions like the Canadian Institute for Health Research, and there's other private and public sector funding as well. As I said, it's a team. It's led by Dr. Sid Kennedy, who's a psychiatrist and a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, but there are a lot of other people involved. And so the categories of people that we have would be psychiatrists and other clinical people. We have uh, neuroimaging experts involved. We have molecular people like myself. That's the category I fit into. 
Uh, we have analysis and data management people. We have a lot of students, and of course, we have the participants, the patients themselves, who are providing samples. And the question that CanBind is trying to address is, can we actually identify biomarkers that would help us at the beginning, when somebody first comes in with depression, to direct them towards a more effective treatment? What's a biomarker? So, a biomarker is any characteristic in an organism, in this case a human, uh, that can be objectively, reproducibly measured, and that measurement can then be correlated with a biological state. So in a lot of biomarker studies, the biological states might be presence of a disease and not presence of a disease. In CanBind, the two biological states that we're interested in, because everybody has depression who is participating, um, is responding to a particular SSRI that we're using in this study or not responding. So those are the two biological states. And we're looking for markers uh, that can differentiate those two states. How are you going to find those markers? Well, uh, there's different kinds of biomarkers. Uh, one of them is a, is a sort of physiological biomarkers, and those are being looked for by the imaging group. So they're doing functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Doing MRIs. MRIs, Another exactly. Another acronym. What the there heck? you go. And uh, they're looking for changes in, in either brain structure or blood flow uh, when these participants are doing certain tests, for instance. So that's physiological biomarkers. The work that I do in my lab and the other molecular people do um, is actually looking at molecular biomarkers and those tend to be DNA, RNA, protein. So DNA being the sort of the blueprint of making all the functional components that make cells function the way they need to. RNA being an intermediary that is um, created basically from DNA and either goes on to, to make proteins or be the substrate to make a protein or in some cases, um, RNA molecules can actually by themselves act as regulatory molecules. We call those microRNAs, and then proteins, of course. So when we're measuring those kinds of biomarkers, we're looking at DNA at the level of sequences, looking for mutations maybe in genes that uh, would, we would logically think might have something to do with the depression process, or in this case, response to drugs. Um, when we're looking at the RNA and the protein, those are very dynamic molecules. Those molecules are present at different levels in different cells at different times. And so it becomes uh, a, a, an extremely difficult undertaking, actually, to try to get a snapshot of the RNA and the protein in addition to the, the DNA level. Uh, Why do you think blood is a good place to look for clues uh, to this problem? So part of the reason we use blood is because there's not another obvious tissue to be using when you're studying depression. So if you were studying cancer, for instance, you would probably use the tumor of interest and study the biomarkers there. Mm -hmm. In depression, there isn't a good tissue for us to go to. You might argue we should look at neuronal tissue. We first of all can't get that from living people, but also it's not necessarily the whole answer because we believe that depression is probably a systemic disease. The blood is accessible, for one thing, mm -hmm. but blood is also a very interesting um, tissue because there's more than one compartment in it. So a lot of people, when they study biomarkers in blood, they're actually looking at the biomarkers in the blood cells, the nucleated blood cells, so the white blood cells mostly. Mm -hmm. And that will give you some kind of an indicator of what's going on in a person's body. But if you remove the cells, the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets from blood, what you have left is something called plasma. And plasma is acellular. It has no cells in it. And so you might imagine that it's a kind of a boring uh, substance that you don't want to look at, but actually it's chock full of biomarkers. And it's chock full of DNA, RNA, and protein, which you might not expect because you think those should be in cells. So the question of how it gets into the plasma is there's two major routes. Um, you either uh, have DNA, RNA, and protein being expelled and into the plasma as cells are dying, a natural death. And of course, that means that cells from all over the body are contributing to what's circulating in the plasma. And the second route by which the biomarkers get there is active signaling. So you might actually have one cell that is pushing out a protein or maybe a microRNA and asking that molecule to go and signal to another cell. And of course, those are also very interesting. We're looking at both of those compartments. But I presume if you want to find something that's depression related, it's got to come from the brain. So how can you tell whether it comes from the brain or somewhere else? Well, we can't tell whether it comes from the brain or something else. And so there's two parts to that question. First of all, I don't know that it does have to come from the brain because we're looking for drug response. So oh, okay. it may not be that the, that the biomarker that we're interested in has to come from the brain. But even if it does, um, the only way to do this really is to look 
deeply enough in enough people that you begin to see patterns. We're never going to be able to sort out probably exactly where the biomarkers are coming from, but all we need them to do is to keep showing up in so the right circumstances. Enough pe so how many people have you got in your study right now? Well, it sort of depends. We've been doing retrospective studies using samples from a different uh, location. We have over a thousand of those. Huh. Uh, in the Canvine study, we're in the hundreds right now, um, but we haven't actually started looking at those samples yet. So those are next on the roster for us to look at. Are hundreds enough samples for you to be able to do your work effectively? <laughs> so now you need a statistician to answer these questions. <laughs> um, we don't know the answer to that, but we, so with a small n, what we're doing instead is getting a lot of data points from each of these people. So we're getting a lot of information about the people in terms of their clinical characteristics. We're getting a lot of information about the MRI uh, data. And then we're getting a lot of molecular information from DNA, RNA, and protein levels in both the cellular and the acellular components of blood. All of those things combined um, may give us a rich enough data set that even with a relatively small number of hundreds mm -hmm. that we're going to be able to start to see something. Okay. What do, what, admittedly a bit of a speculative question here, but what would you put as the likelihood of depression having a unique biomarker in blood? A unique biomarker in blood? Almost zero. I, I don't think that we're going to find a biomarker that is going to tell us what we're looking for. But you I, might find some? Well, I think what we're more likely to find is, if you think about all of these different biomarkers that we're studying as maybe different types of Lego bricks, mm -hmm. uh, so RNA, DNA, protein, physiological biomarkers, one kind of biomarker is probably not going to give us an answer. I think it's going to be a mixture. There's probably going to be a biomarker from here and from here and from here that we can put together as a model oh. that is going to give us the information that we're looking for. I think if there were a single biomarker, let's say a DNA sequence, we would know that by now, uh, and we don't. Any guesses as to how long you think this mission will take? No, actually. <laughs> I, but I, would I presume hate to we're guess. talking, I mean, we're talking years here, right? Well, we are talking years because once you identify what you think might be a good biomarker signature, of course, you have to take another set of samples and do it again and show that it mm -hmm. replicates. Uh, because it's very easy with these kinds of data. They're so detailed and there's so many data points per patient uh, that you can actually run into a situation where you do see something, you think you've got something, and then you go to another population and it doesn't happen again. It's it doesn't reproduce. It's a one-off. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure that that's not what you've got. So it's going to take time even just to validate. Mm -hmm. There's a Danish drug manufacturer, confess, haven't heard of them before, Lundbeck. How have they contributed to your efforts here? So Lundbeck is, uh, yes, is a Danish pharmaceutical company that's focused on brain diseases, including depression, drug development. Um, they're uh, one of the Canbine sponsors, actually. But more than that, they've actually allowed us to access uh, some archival um, samples from a clinical trial that they had run using a different SSRI. And uh, using, uh, these are the 1,000 samples I mentioned earlier. So using those samples, we've actually, all of us in the labs, and there's a number of labs involved, um, have been able to basically get our platforms ready and make sure that everything we need to do is working for the Canvine samples. And more than that, we've also been able to start to do analysis on those 1,000 samples. So even mm -hmm. though it's not the same SSRI as what we're using in Canbind, uh, it still allows us to start to figure out how to do these analysis and, and how to move forward. So Lundbeck has been extremely helpful in that way. I presume, though, it's not a coincidence that is it the first drug that you'll be studying as one of their drugs? But it actually kind of is a coincidence. It is a coincidence. It, it is, oh. in, in the sense that the way the drug was actually, so, so it's important to realize that CanMind is not actually about testing a new drug. CanBind is about looking for biomarkers for drug response. So they had to use a drug that was tried and true. And so to do that, the uh, clinical leads of CanBind actually spent a good deal of time doing lit searches, literature searching, sorry, um, and uh, trying to identify a drug that had very good efficacy, so works very well in most people, or a large number of people, and had minimal negative side effects. And the drug that we're using in Canbine, which is escitalopram, is actually a drug that came out very close to the top, happens to be a Lundbeck drug. Sorry, what's it called? <laughs> I knew you'd make me say it again. <laughs> escitalopram. Escitalopram. Yes. Who thinks up these cockamamie names for all these know. drugs? You know, when you watch TV commercials and you see these drug names, sometimes it's hilarious. Anyways, it sounds like, just inferring from all of what you've told us so far tonight, 
that you are just going to have mountains upon mountains upon mountains of data to look at by the time this is all said and done. How are you going to wade through all of that information? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so I guess the, the simple answer is I'm not. That's not part of That's my somebody job. Else's job. Somebody else's job. Um, so there's two aspects to this, actually. So yes, there are are absolutely mountains of data, and there are, are a lot of dangers in handling that much data, as in the data can become uh, sort of convoluted or it can become corrupted. And so there's one of the aspects that's really important has been data management. And so making sure that the data are handled properly, that they're de-identified, that they're, they're kept private, that they are um, uh, kept in an intact way. And uh, to do that, the Ontario Brain Institute has actually funded the creation of a large uh, electronic platform called Brain Code. And Brain Code is essentially a repository to house um, all of the data that's being generated by actually all of the Ontario Brain Institute programs, not just CanBind. Uh, so that's one of the efforts that's, that's been ongoing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and, and that's been uh, largely driven by a group called Indoc Research. On the actual analysis side, though, we have a team um, who will be coming together uh, to start looking at how best to wade through all these data. And the easiest way to think about doing it, I suppose, is if you look at it as a big matrix and you take one type of biomarker and ask if any of the biomarkers in that set correlate against what you're interested in, which is drug response in our case, and then you pull out the best from that, and then after you've done that for each of the types of biomarkers, you start going across and do mm -hmm. a more integrative analysis. I make it sound like it's relatively straightforward. There's no rule book for doing this kind of work. This integrative analysis is actually quite novel, um, and it's one of the things that makes Canbine unique, hmm. actually. In our last 30 seconds here, what's the next thing on your agenda? The next thing on the CanBind agenda is actually there is many other CanBind studies already in preparation. So some of them are looking at different treatment modalities, uh, neurostimulation, um, talk therapy, uh, and looking for biomarkers of that as well. Uh, there's some interesting work going on looking at resistance uh, to depression. So people who under the same environmental uh, uh, trigger that might have triggered depression in one person doesn't in somebody else. What's the difference mm -hmm. between those people? And that might actually be the first steps towards prevention. So there's a lot of very exciting work that's going on. There is a website. If people are interested, they just need to Google CanBind. And there's a great website that describes all the new programs that are coming out. C-A-N-B-I-N-D. That's correct. CanBind. Yes. Harriet, we're so grateful you took the train this morning, early this morning, to <laughs> come in uh, from Kingston, Ontario, to join us here in our studio tonight. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.